So we're about to talk about the idea of motor units. Uh, now that we've gone over kind of the general idea of how an action potential leads to a twitch, I want to take just a moment to look out kind of one level at how muscles are going to contract, how they're going to work as a whole, and then go back down into the details of how they work at a low level. So the idea of a, the idea of the, let me get this up here. The idea of a motor unit is that if I've got a whole set of muscle fibers, so I'll draw a bunch of them in here. So here's 10 skeletal muscle fibers, all probably bundled together into one fascicle. Now, if I want to think about how these muscle fibers work, we've just talked about how a motor neuron synapses onto a muscle fiber and causes a twitch, but we don't, there are so many muscle fibers in a muscle that having a separate motor neuron for each one would present some problems. Uh, primarily, it's a, that's a lot of motor neurons. And second, how would you coordinate them all? If you've got a muscle fiber, if you've got a muscle fiber with hundreds of thousands of neurons, with hundreds of thousands of fibers of muscle, and each one is controlled by one motor neuron, you would need hundreds of thousands of neurons, which are very hard to coordinate all together. So instead, muscle fibers are grouped into what we call motor units. If I imagine one motor neuron here, this motor neuron will control some group of these muscle fibers. So here's one motor neuron, we'll call it the red neuron, and it controls those three particular muscle fibers. If we bring in the blue neuron here, we'll have it control these three. And the green motor neuron I guess I only drew nine, will control those three muscle fibers. So I'll just sort of, sort of shade them in here. This is a green and a green and a green. And here's our blue, blue and blue. And this is red, red and red. Now, when say the blue motor neuron has an action potential, the, we have no way of sending it to only one of the groups, only to just one of those fibers. So the blue neuron having an action potential causes a twitch in the three blue muscle fibers. Likewise, the red motor neuron causes a twitch in the three red muscle fibers. We call one motor neuron plus, plus all of the muscle fibers it innervates. The word innervates, meaning having synapses with. That we call a motor unit. So in this muscle, the motor units contain three muscle fibers each, one motor neuron plus three fibers it controls. Uh, a given fiber is only ever controlled by one neuron, so that blue muscle fiber will not have any other motor neurons controlling it. It can't be both a blue and a green. Uh, it can't be in both blue and green motor unit, for example. Now, how many fibers are controlled by a, by a given neuron depends on what kind of muscle we're looking at. So in muscles for small, finely controlled movements, those are going to have small motor units, meaning f only a few fibers per neuron. For example, the muscles that control the movement of your eyes, that let you move your eyes around and point them at different things, have to be capable of very, very small movements. We need to be able to move the eye just a tiny bit at a time. So if I had each motor neuron controlling, say, a thousand, motor, a thousand muscle fibers, when those thousand fibers twitch, we'd get a big movement, and we wouldn't be able to get anything smaller. So instead, uh, in muscles like that, like in the eye muscles, you're looking at about 10 fibers per neuron. Uh, 
Now contrast that with muscles that are, say, the big muscles that move large limbs around, like your quadriceps that moves your, that uh, extends the knee. So large muscles, which are for large force, forceful movements. Which, with those, you're talking more like, say, the quadriceps, which is the big muscle at the front of your thigh. That's going to be more like 1,000 to 2,000 fibers per neuron. So think about how that's, what the difference is going to be there. If I want to make a fairly small movement with my eye, say I want to move it a little bit and I need 30 muscle fibers to produce that much force. My brain can say, okay, I want 30 muscle fibers of force. That's about three motor units. So you three motor neurons fire. And then those will cause three motor units to twitch, which is about 30 total fibers, and the eye will move the right amount. Now, let's say I went to the thigh and said, okay, I want a very small movement. I just need 30 muscle fibers. And my brain looks it up, says, I can give you a thousand. And it sends one motor, one action potential down one motor neuron, and it goes to a thousand muscle fibers, and we get a thousand rather than 30. We can't make the very small, finely controlled movements with the big muscles like the quadriceps. On the other hand, if the quadriceps were controlled like the eyes and you controlled 10 units at a time, let's say you wanted to jump off the ground. That's a big, powerful movement. You're going to need a lot of muscle fibers. And say you look it up and say, okay, I'm going to need uh, 10,000. I'm going to need 10,000 muscle fibers for this, for this contraction. Now, normally with the quadriceps, you'd say, okay, that's a 10 motor units. Okay, you 10, go. And they all go at once and you get a big, powerful contraction. But if it were controlled like the eye muscles, where it's 10 fibers per neuron, you might have something where you said, okay, I need 10,000 fibers. And the brain says, okay, that's a thousand motor neurons. And it tries to organize them all to go at the same time. And that's just too many. So for big, powerful movements, it's helpful to have large motor units. That way it's easy to coordinate them. But if you need small, finely controlled actions, then you need small motor units. If you want to prove this to yourself, grab a pen between your knees and try to write your name and see how well you can control those small movements you need for something like handwriting with the big muscles of your hips and thighs. All right, so that's the idea of motor units. Now we're going to get into the idea of excitation contraction coupling. So in the previous uh, lecture part, we went over that broad overview where we talked about one action potential causes release of acetylcholine, muscle action potential, release of calcium, blah, blah, blah. Here we're going to get into the details on a part of that. We're going to talk about what happens from the muscle action potential happening in, along the sarcolemma to calcium getting into the myofibrils. How does that action potential cause calcium release? That's the question we're asking right now. And the answer to that is a process called excitation contraction coupling. So let me... All right. So this is excitation contraction coupling, sometimes just abbreviated ECC. The idea behind that name is excitation, meaning having an action potential, electrical excitation of the muscle fiber, contraction being the movement of the muscle. How do we tie those two together? Now, to talk about that, I'm going to need to sketch up our muscle fiber, but I'm going to do it slightly differently than we did before. So this here is going to be a T-tubule. Here's going to be our neuromuscular junction. And then inside the cell, here's going to be some sarcoplasmic reticulum and the terminal cistern where it comes up against the T-tubule. So the myofibril is not seen on here, but you'd have to imagine it sort of behind this, wrapped inside that uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. We've got all those Swiss cheese-like holes on here too. So again, this is the terminal cistern. And leave some room because we're going to draw a close-up of this in a little bit. We're going to need to zoom in on a part of this. 
So our sequence of events, if you remember, went something like this. First, release of acetylcholine from the motor neuron. That was up here. That activated nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And that lets sodium in. Okay. And we alluded to this, but I'm just going to sketch it in a little more clearly now. Along the sarcolemma, we have voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels. So we, just like we in a nerve cell axon, when that sodium comes in and causes a depolarization there at this neuromuscular junction, uh, just so you know, this structure here on the muscle cell is called the motor end plate. This part right here, from here to here. And this area where we have the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, that's the motor end plate. And the sometimes we call the graded potential that you get there an end plate potential, just in case you see those terms. They're not ones I use very often. But that end plate potential, so that causes a end plate potential, which is really just a positive graded potential. That end plate potential triggers a muscle action potential. When that end plate potential reaches these voltage gated channels, it will be big enough if everything went correctly to open the sodium channels and cause that big inrush of sodium that causes an action potential. And it works very much like the ones in nerve cells. So our, that triggers our big action potential, which is now propagating along the sarcolemma. So the action potential propagates into the T-tubule. Uh, just one thing to keep in mind, it doesn't only go into the T-tubule, just like if you had a flood in a yard when it got to the gopher hole, some water would go down the gopher hole, but the rest just goes around and keeps going. So in addition to going down the T-tubule, my action potential is continuing on, but it also comes down the T-tubule. And here's where we're, something's going to happen, because somehow this action potential in the T-tubule has to trigger the release of the calcium that's stored in the terminal cistern. So we want to understand how does an action potential in the T-tubule cause release of calcium? And we're going to have to look closely because as it turns out, there's a proteins here. There are proteins on both the T-tubule and the terminal cistern, which are going to interact in a way that allows that calcium to come out. So let's zoom in. So here was our T-tubule, and here was our terminal cistern. And what we're going to find, get this working right, is that there's a pair of proteins here. I'm going to draw them in. Now, here in orange, we have something called the DHP receptor. The DHP receptor, that in case you want to know, that stands for dihydropyridine. Um, it, we call it a receptor because somebody did find that if you put dihydropyridine on this cell, it causes this thing to respond. 
but that's not actually relevant to how it normally works. It just happens that it responds to this chemical dihydropyridine. So we just call it a DHP receptor, but it's not really acting like a receptor exactly here. What it is, technically, this is going to get a little confusing, so you might listen to it first and then go back. It's, it is a voltage-gated calcium channel. But it doesn't work as a channel in skeletal muscle. In other words, when it goes through a change in voltage, it's not actually going to open a pore and let calcium go through. It is still going to respond. It still changes its shape in response to voltage, but it doesn't actually open as a channel when it's in skeletal muscle. I just think of it as sort of twisting in response to voltage. So when the action potential comes down this T-tubule and it passes over the DHP receptor, the DHP receptor is going to twist itself and respond to that. Now, what is that going to do? We'll get to that. Here on the terminal cistern, we have something called a RYR, which is a ryanidine receptor. Again, ryanidine is not actually relevant to this. It was named as because someone found that ryanidine caused it to respond. Uh, don't worry about that. What it is, this is a calcium gated calcium channel. By which I mean it is a calcium channel and the ligand that causes it to open is calcium. But here we have this interesting thing where the calcium is here in the terminal cistern and the spot that opens this channel is actually here on the outside. So if that's the spot where the calcium would have to bind, the calcium in here can't get to that. So the calcium isn't opening the ryanidine receptor. It's normally staying closed. So we're looking at this and say, OK, I've got a twisting DHP receptor and a closed calcium channel. I don't see how it's going to work. The last piece that's missing here is that the DHP receptor is physically attached to the ryanidine receptor in such a way that when the DHP receptor twists, it's actually going to pull open the ryanidine receptor. The DHP receptor is going to move and cause the ryanidine receptor to open up. So in a way, it kind of makes the ryanidine receptor almost a mechanoreceptor, but I wouldn't think of it that way. So here's our sequence of events. Our action potential propagates into the T-tubule. So here it comes. And it gets to the DHP receptor. So the action potential causes the DHP receptor to twist, really just to change shape a little bit in response to the change in membrane potential. That makes the DHP receptor pull open the ranidine receptor. So that is going to cause this to open up which is going to cause calcium comes out of the terminal cistern. So when that opens up, out comes calcium. Now notice when the calcium starts coming out, one of the things it can do is bind to the ranidine receptor to help hold it open. Even though this action potential in the muscle cell lasts only about a millisecond, as that passes over the DHP and it pulls open the ryanidine, that's going to end in just a, just a millisecond. But the calcium that comes out will hold the ryanidine receptor open for a little while. So 
calcium does two things. Holds open the ranadine receptor for a few milliseconds and calcium gets into the myofibrils. Now, once the calcium is in the myofibrils, it's going to interact with all those protein filaments in a way that's going to cause them to contract. To, in order to understand that, you're going to have to learn about how those filaments are arranged, which means learning about something called sliding filament theory. But right now, just make sure you understand this part of the sequence of events. So in your head, you're building this overall structure. And in a way, you can almost make it into a little chant. You can say, Action potential in the motor neuron. Release acetylcholine onto the neuromuscular junction. Acetylcholine binds to nicotinic receptors. Nicotinic receptors let sodium in, causing a graded potential, which triggers a muscle action potential. Muscle action potential propagates along down into the T-tubules. In the T-tubules, it hits the DHP receptor, which pulls open the ranadine receptor, which lets the calcium out of the terminal cistern. Calcium is then going to get into the myofibrils and do something. So the set, that last part of excitation contraction coupling, that something, is one thing we're going to talk about in the next, uh, next part of the lecture. So I'll see you for that one.